Israel and say unto them, When ye be come over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person that unawares. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And of these cities which ye shall give, six cities shall you have for refuge. Numbers 35, verses 25 through 28. It says, And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood. And the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whether he was fled, and he shall abide in it until the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of refuge, whether he fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and then the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. Because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. Lord, I ask you tonight, God, to bless your word. I ask you, Lord, to anoint these lips of clay. Lord, I know that your, Lord, that your word is going to go forth and not return void, God. I ask you, Lord, that your word would go out and touch someone's heart tonight. Lord, that it will minister to somebody tonight, God, that you would use me, Lord, for your will and for your purpose. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I like what I felt in this place tonight. I said I like what I felt in this place tonight. I believe that God spoke to me, Brother Larry, and I believe I got a word for somebody here tonight. I want to talk to you about this subject. A fool outside the place of refuge. I want to talk to you about a fool outside the place of refuge. I'm going to lay a little groundwork if you'll just bear with me for, for just a little while. This passage that we read speaks about six cities that were going to be six cities of refuge, Brother Richard. There were three, three east of the Jordan River and there were three that were west of the Jordan River. They were placed so that there was not a member of any of the 12 tribes that couldn't easily reach these cities if they needed to be. They, were, they weren't too far for anybody to reach. And they were available for anybody. Brother Terry, they were there for anybody to come unto. They were provided for a person if they accidentally killed somebody, if there was accidentally a life taken, which they didn't mean to, Brother Marcus. These cities were provided for a place of refuge. They could run to these cities. And there will be some other things that happened, Brother Johnny, that I will get into in just a little bit. But these six cities are listed in Joshua chapter 20. And it lists the six cities of refuge. Kadesh was in Galilee, located on the mountain of Natala. And Kadesh means to sanctify or to set apart, to consecrate, and therefore to make holy. The second city was Shechem. On Mount Ephraim, and the name means between the shoulders or a burden bearer, if you will. Hebron, in the Mount of Judah, and Hebron means a place of fellowship. Remember that name, Hebron. Bezer, B E Z E R, in the wilderness, upon the plain. Bezer signified a fortified place, a place of solitude, a place that wasn't easy to get into, Brother Johnny. Ramoth in Gilead means a high place or a place that was exalted. Golan and Bashan strictly means joy. Joy. These were the six cities that was appointed to be the cities of refuge. That if somebody accidentally took somebody else's life, Brother Greg, they could go into and they were going to be safe. The cities of those days were ruled by the tribe of the Levites or the priests of that day, if you will. They were a safe place for a person to flee if they had accidentally killed somebody else. The city provided asylum to the fugitive by sheltering and protecting him until a trial could be held, Sister Eloise, to determine whether he was guilty or whether he was innocent. If in judgment of the city elders, the death had occurred accidentally and without intent, the man was allowed to stay there, Brother Larry, until the death 
of the high priest. As long as he remained inside the city until the death of the high priest, in which the high priest had died, Brother Ray, and the high priest had gone, then this man was to be set free and become a free man to return to his family if he was found innocent. If they were found guilty, then they were given over to his accusers. Those probably of the family of the life they had taken. They were given over to them and more likely, Brother Greg, they would be put to death. If at any time, would you listen to this, if at any time this person left the city of refuge while the high priest was still alive, then he was fair game. If he ever got out of the gates of the city, then he could be killed, Brother Marcus. Those that were after him, those that were looking for him, they could take his life and it would be all right. There wouldn't be anything they could do because he left, or they left, the city of refuge. Because they chose to leave the city of refuge. And before I get into the, the main part of my sermon tonight, I want to take a little closer at the cities, what the cities actually provided. They were a refuge, which Webster Dictionary defines as a protection from danger or distress, a retreat or a shelter. They were a place that someone could run to and they could be safe. They could run to in a time of desperation in their life and they would be safe. There's nothing that anybody could do to them as long as they could get into the gates of the city. And they were found to be innocent. They were safe. It was a safe place for them. Sister Callie's song said that God is a refuge. This is a place of refuge tonight. God is a place of refuge. God is a place of refuge in so many so many, so many, so many, so many times people turn their back and they never realize that. It's a place of shelter. It's a place of retreat that we go to and we're safe. The only problem that you and I have faced tonight is that we were born sinners. I said we were born sinners. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody's exempt from sin. We've all experienced it in our life. Romans 5.12 says, For by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon men that all has sinned. Well, McKinney, none of us are exempt tonight. We've all had sin in our life. We all know that we have got to get sin under, our, under the blood. It's not our fault. And I want you to hear me tonight. It's not our fault that we were born sinners. I said it's not our fault that we were born sinners. We inherited it from Adam. But it is our fault if we choose to stay that way. I said it is our fault if we choose to stay that way. If we choose to stay and live in sin, then it's our fault. It falls on us. The punishment that we face in judgment, it'll be because we chose to do that. Because we chose to do that. We all have a choice tonight. We've all been given a choice. And it depends on what you do with it. I said it depends on what you do with it. Don't let anybody else influence you in living from God. I said, don't let anybody influence you in from living for God. Don't let anything influence you from living for God. This is where it's all at. This is what it's all about. We, we're living in the last days, folks. We know that. He said, when you see these signs come to pass, he said, look up for my redemption draweth nigh. We're living in the last days. Brother Johnny, you said it. Brother Larry, you said it. Brother GL's been telling us we're living in the last days. I didn't think I would ever, ever see that years and years ago. I've been living, been living for the Lord for 39 years. You know, back then we thought the Lord was coming, but so much more the closer right now. The Bible tells us not forsaking the assembly of ourselves as the matter of some is, but so much more as we see the day approaching. Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us that. Just like there was a death sentence on all those who took the life of another, there's a death sentence that's been placed on every one of us here tonight. 
Everyone that has been born into this world has had a death sentence placed on your life. I know it might sound absurd and it might sound strange, but when a person's born, when a baby's born, the death process begins. We want to think about it being life, Brother Pete, but actually the death process begins when we're born. Sin promises death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's where we're going to find the eternal life tonight. It's going to be through Jesus. These cities were provided by the grace of God, and He made a way of escape for the innocent. God was the one that told them to set these cities up, Brother Ray. John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Bear with me a little bit. I've got a story I want to tell. A sad story, but one I need to tell. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 27 through 33 says, then when Abner was returned to Hebron, Hebron, one of the six cities of refuge, when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. And he smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asiel, his brother. And afterwards, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner." Let it rest on the head of Joab and all of his father's house. And let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner, because he had slain their brother Asiel at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, Rend your clothes. And gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the briar of the funeral possession. And they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth. Sad words, Brother Larry. Died Abner as a fool dieth. Abner was the commander-in-chief of Saul's army. He was a very, very capable leader. He was King Saul's cousin, very close. He was a family member. And it was Abner that introduced David to King Saul. And David's exploits in in, in, in the many battles that he won exalted him up so much in the kingdom that he was second in command behind Abner. We all know the story that the people began to say that that Saul's killed his thousands and David's killed his ten thousands because of his mighty exploits. And this, this makes Saul really, really mad and he wants to kill David. He wants to have David put to death. Even read the story where David's playing the heart for Saul to calm him because Saul would get these evil spirits up on him and David would be playing the heart for him. And Saul would just take a sword and throw at him, brother, brother Billy. He wanted to, he wanted to kill David. The Bible says David flees from Saul, and now the duty's been placed on Abner to track him down. Abner's going after David because he wants David dead. Sometime during all this that's going on, Saul dies. Saul passes away. We know that he falls on his own sword, and I believe it was an Amalekite that wound up killing him, Brother Larry. But something happened, and Abner uses his military power, and he helps set up Saul's son, Shabeth. It's a, it's a hard name to pronounce, but he helps him set up his kingdom because he wants to put his allegiance behind Saul's son. And he said that this, this king ruled for, over Israel for two years. Now we look at Joab. Joab was David's nephew. He was David's sister's son. And he was David's commander-in-chief of David's army. He had two other brothers, which is Abishai and Asiel. Joab was a very, very hard man. He was a very ruthless man. He was a very military-minded man, if you will. If you remember the story, it was, it was Joab that David gave the letter to that said, Take Uriah, 
Bathsheba's wife after David sinned with her and committed adultery. David gave Joab the letter. And he said, you take Uriah to the front line where he might be killed at. This is a man I'm talking about when I talk about Joab. Joab was a very, very hard man. He didn't think anything about killing. It was just a part of his nature. One day there's a battle that takes place. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. It says, one day a battle takes place at Gibeon and Abner's military forces confront David's military forces. There's a, a fierce battle that takes place. Joab and his two brothers, Abishai and Asiel, is part of, the, part of the army of Joab. And Abner's army is there. And there's a fierce battle that takes place. And Brother Larry, the battle gets so fierce, the battle gets so hot, that Abner turns and he flees and he takes off running. And the Bible says that Asiel which was Joab's brother. The Bible says that this young man was light of foot as a wild road. Brother Billy, he could run like a deer. He was fast. And he took off after Abner. And the Bible says that he almost had Abner. And Abner told him, he said, young man, he said, if you know what's best for you, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, you'll turn around and you'll leave me alone. Turn around and leave me alone. At one point, Brother Marcus, he told him, he said, you better take one of these young men's Young men's uh, armor, if you will, if you're going to keep following after me. And, and the Bible says that Abner, and, and I believe that it was an accident. I believe that he did not mean to kill this young man. But it said Abner warned him two times to turn away, but Asiel would not. So Abner takes the butt end. The Bible says it's the hinder end of his spear. And the English Standard Version said it was the butt end of his spear. If he meant to kill him, he would have stuck him with a point. But he takes, he takes his sword and he hits him under the fifth rib. Maybe he's just trying to knock the wind out of him. Maybe he's just trying to scare him away so this young man will leave him alone. Because Abner was a very, very uh, a competent military leader. And here, if I'm reading this right, this young man doesn't even have any armor on. He's coming after him. He's going to try to kill him. Maybe he's just trying to scare him. But the Bible says that the butt of the spear comes out the backside underneath the fifth rib. And Asiel dies right there on the spot. Abner takes his life. Sometimes while, while all this is going on, Abner decides, he sees that David's kingdom is going to be the one that is. David's going to be the king. So he asks for a meeting. He asks for a meeting with King David. He said, I want, I want to meet with you. I'm going to change my allegiance to you, King David. Uh, he, he has been accused, one of the parts I forgot, he'd been accused of having an affair with one of Saul's concubines. His son had accused him, and Abner gets mad, and he realizes that David's going to be king of the city, so he, or king, of, king of Israel. So he arranges a meeting with David in the city of Hebron. Brother Billy, that's a city of refuge. That's a city of refuge. Abner pledges his allegiance to David to help him unite the kingdom. 2 Samuel 3 and 20 says, And so Abner came to David to Hebron, and 20 men with him. And, Abner, and David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. Now Joab, David's military commander, he finds out about this. He wants revenge against Abner for killing his brother. Joab wants revenge for killing his brother. Asiel, he's very upset. When he finds out that Abner had met with King David, he said, all he's trying to do is find your goings ins and your comings out. He's just trying to find out what, what your plan is, David. He's not being honest and sincere. Abner's just trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe, maybe Joab was afraid that Abner might take his place. I don't know what was taking place, but it, it upset him. And the Bible says that as Joab leaves David, he sends messengers to arrange a meeting between Abner and himself. 2 Samuel 3, 26 through 27. And it says, And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sarah, but David knew it not. When Abner was returned to Hebron, he's left, he's come back. Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. And he smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asiel, his brother. Now I will tell you right now, as I study for this lesson, Brother Larry, I never found a place where Abner fled to the city of Hebron. He never fled there. He, he, he didn't go there 
for the purpose of seeking asylum. I, I don't find it anywhere in the scripture. But the fact of the matter is that he was there. And I believe that he knew in his heart what Hebron meant. I believe that he knew what could happen at Hebron. He, he could be safe there, but never did I find where he sought the city for an asylum. But he's there. Nevertheless, he's there. Many people, hear me now, many people come to church. Many people seek after God. Never realizing this is a safe place. Never realizing this is the place we'll find refuge. We'll find refuge in Him. This is a safe place. This life is a safe way. It's a safe place, Sister Jamie. It's a safe place. Many people never realize that. Many people never, never understand that. I grew up with a large, large youth group. We, we probably had 150 young people in our church at Malden where I grew up at. A huge youth group. And Facebook is a great thing. We get so connected with Facebook and we get to, get to see some of our old friends that we grew up with, Brother Larry. And there's very few of those that I grew up with. Now, there's a few. But there's very few of them that is living this life today. Oh, they go to church, but they don't go to church where the truth is preached. They don't go to church where the truth is preached. And that kills me because we were all taught the same thing. We were all taught the same way. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the life. Brother Hill preached it. I come over here when I was, me and Sister Sharon got married when I was 19. I've actually went to church here longer than in the church at Malden where I grew up at. But I came here, and guess what? Brother McKinney preached the same message. He preached the same message. This truth does not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. This, this message does not change. It is the same. Brother GL is still preaching this message. It is the truth. I said it is the truth. It's the Word of God and it's the truth. And it breaks my heart when I see that, that these, these young people that I grew up with, it's not living for God. Not living for God. I want to look closely at this tonight. This, this is one of my main focal points. The Bible says, Abner returned to Hebron, the city of refuge. He's in a safe place. He's in a city of refuge. And he knows that Joab wants to kill him to avenge the death of his brother. Brother Billy, I, I read this and I'm trying to figure out, what in the world is he thinking? What in the world is going through his mind? Does, does he think he's invincible? Does he think there's nothing ever going to happen to him, Sister Margaret? He agrees to meet with Joab. It would have been fine, Sister Nadine, if it would have taken place within the gates of the city. It would have been fine if it had took place inside the city walls because there's nothing according to the law that Joab could have done to him. But the Bible says Joab took Abner aside the gates of the city and he smote him under the fifth rib and Abner died for the blood of Asiel. Such a sad story. He was in a safe place. He was in a place of refuge. And he let the enemy, somebody hear me right now, he let the enemy coerce him to the outside. He let him, let him take him to a place that wasn't safe. And he died as a fool died. He died as a fool died. Abner, you're so close to the city of refuge where it's safe, yet you're so far outside the protection of the walls. What were you thinking, young man? What was going through your mind? David said Abner died as a fool dieth. Webster's Dictionary describes the word fool as a person who lacks good sense or judgment. Abner, what was you thinking? What was your judgment at? You knew Joab wanted to kill you. 
You knew Joab wanted to kill you. Psalms 53 and 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Abner left the city of Hebron and he paid the price with his life. Just as there's people that I talked about a while ago and people today that are leaving God and forgetting that He's a safe place, Brother Johnny. Forgetting that He's the place of refuge. Your song said, Sister Callie, He's a place of refuge. He's a fortress. He's a place of solitude. Psalms 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalms 91, 1 and 2 said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. He's a stronghold. My God in Him will I trust. Psalm 62, 6 through 8 said, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust Him in all times, ye people. Pour out your hearts before Him, for God is a refuge for us. God's our refuge. He's our place of shelter. He's our place of protection from danger and from trouble. I really feel like somebody needed to hear this message tonight. Maybe you're here and you've already walked away from God. Maybe you've already turned your back on God and turned a deaf ear to the cries of God. Maybe you're contemplating it in your mind. Maybe you're thinking about this is just maybe not the life that I want to live. Well, let me tell you, don't go outside the gates of refuge. Don't go outside the walls of protection that God provides. Don't do it. Maybe you think the battle you're fighting is too hard. Let me remind you of what happened to Abner. Think about it. He left the city of refuge. I can't say that and think about it over and over. He left the safe place. He let the enemy get him outside the walls. We're living so close to the coming of the Lord and now is not the time to let Satan destroy your life. Now is not the time to let Satan destroy your walk with God because we're living so close to the coming of the God. I said we're right there at it. Don't. Don't, don't. There's nothing that's worth it. There's nothing worth going back on God for. This world has nothing to offer us. I said this world has nothing to offer us. Let me tell you something tonight. Satan's not fighting against you because you're weak. He's fighting against you because you're strong. I said he's not fighting against you because you're weak. He's fighting against you because you're strong in the Lord. And he don't like that. He don't like it. I said this Monday night at prayer meeting, Satan wants to limit your praying because he knows that your praying is going to limit him. When we fall on our knees and we begin to cry out to God, that's when we put the handcuffs on the, on the old devil, Brother Larry. That's when we begin to bind him and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Leave me alone. Get out of here with your lies. Get out of here with your lies. First Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, the English Standard Version says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The devil is an imposter. I said the devil is an imposter. Let me, let me tell you something else. If you didn't know this, the devil can't read your mind. I said the devil can't read your mind. He don't know what's going on right here. The only way he knows is if you show him or if you act it out. But Larry, he can't read your mind. He don't know what's going on there. He don't know what's happening. He's an imposter. He tries to be something that he's not. I said he tries to be something that he's not and that he never can be. But I'm here to tell you tonight, my defender... The one that fights for me, the one that goes for me, not offender, is Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I said, he will fight for me. Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ will fight for me. The new boy sing a song that says, my God's not dead. 
I said, my God's not dead.